In college, I would go home every other weekend to work at the job I had had since high school. I would drive directly from campus after my last class on Friday to my job, about an hour. And after my shift was done, I'd go back to my parents' house, which was out in the middle of nowhere. My parents weren't yet home when I got back from work. They often spent their Friday and Saturday evenings drinking like they were the ones in college. So the house was dark, and since it was mid-fall, so was the yard, save for the yard light. I pulled into my normal parking spot, got out of the car, and then turned to open the back door of my car and get my backpack out of the back seat. That's when I noticed that the bathroom light was on. Was that light on when I pulled up? It must have been, right? As I was contemplating the light and reaching for my backpack, there was suddenly a very angry looking woman standing in the window, staring at me. We're not talking rusting bitch face here either. She was pissed off at me and I knew it. We stood there staring at each other for a good 10 seconds when my parents pulled into the driveway and distracted me from my stare down with the woman in the bathroom. By the time I turned back, the light was still on, but the woman was gone. We never saw her again. Back when I lived in my very first apartment, I would always hear what sounded like a little child calling for their parent. Now at first, I thought it was just genuinely some kid who was lost, because the complex was big enough for a kid to wander off from their parents. But the voice seemed to always be right next to me. It wasn't until I moved out that I found out a little girl was actually killed there in the 80s. So I had a football coach back in high school, who was also one of my teachers for a semester. He told us one story that freaked us all out pretty badly. He had a coaching job at a small college in Montana when he was a lot younger and newly married. He said that after practice one evening, he was making the long commute home and the route ran alongside just fields and fields of hay and grain and stuff like that. Since it was late summer or early fall, it wasn't even approaching dark yet. His car was an old beat up truck with just a bench seat. Anyway, he's driving along when he sees a hitchhiker on the shoulder. This being back in the day and in a small town in Montana, my teacher pulled over to let the guy in without a second thought. The man was described as wearing a really old, outdated style of suit. Not quite a zoot suit, but styled in a similar baggy way. He also had on a big stylish hat. The guy looked like he was out of the 40s and sort of a pimp, which is how my teacher put it. My teacher thought that it was weird that he was so overdressed because it was super hot out. But maybe that was the only clothing he had, he figured. The guy gets in next to my teacher without a word. The teacher asks him where he needs to go, and the guy just points forward. So the teacher drives on. Later, my teacher tries to talk to the guy, just trying to make simple conversation. But the guy wouldn't speak or even acknowledge him. He just put his hat down, like he was sleeping. Out of nowhere, the guy just tips his hat up, looks out the window and says, stop the car, now. My teacher pulls over and lets him out, not wanting to offend this guy. The guy stands on the side of the road for a second and then at a dead sprint, just runs off into the field beside the road until my teacher couldn't see him anymore. Granted, the crop was fairly tall, he waits there for a while, thinking maybe the guy had to use the restroom or something and had to do it out in the middle of nowhere. But after a long enough wait, 
My teacher just gets back in the truck and starts to accelerate back on the road. The thing about really old trucks is that they don't accelerate very fast. As my teacher got back on the road, he looked in his rearview mirror to check for a safe merge, but there wasn't a car in sight. What there was, was the hitchhiker, on all fours like an animal, running after the truck at an inhuman speed. Meanwhile, my teacher is beginning to fishtail as he attempts to go faster. The whole time, his eyes are just glued on the mirror, watching the man chase after his car on all fours. Eventually, he was able to get up to speed and lost sight of the guy in the mirror. When he was able to stop at a gas station to use a payphone, he called his wife at home to tell her the story and to lock up the house. She thinks that he's just messing with her and he had been talking to her coworker about the hitchhiker. When he asks why she would think that and what her coworker had to do with it, she said that apparently at her office in the town she worked in, one of her coworkers told her a story of the exact same thing happening to them. And apparently it's a well-known urban legend in that town. She thought it was just folks playing with the new girl at work who had to drive home late at night. My teacher assures her that he was not lying and evidently she believes him and can vouch for her side of the story because she showed up at one of our fundraisers and I asked her about it. So, yeah, now I just avoid lonely roads in Montana. Around 10 years ago, I was staying in an old bungalow where my nan lived. The bungalow itself always had a slightly creepy vibe to it, but I didn't pay it much attention. The temperature in the room that I stayed in would randomly drop very quickly out of nowhere. And whenever this happened, I could always sense a pressure difference, similar to how your ears feel when you enter a tunnel. One night I was asleep in bed and the temperature dropped so suddenly that it actually woke me up. Again, my ears felt like there was this big drop in pressure, as if all the sound and air had been drawn out of the room. I looked around the dark room, and there at the foot of my bed, looking up at me, was a face. It looked skeletal. The weird thing was, you would think that this would be terrifying, and if somebody described this happening to them, I would think how scary it must have been but I felt no fear whatsoever. As ridiculous as it sounds, my mind just kind of rationalized it. Like, oh, that's weird. And then I must have just fallen back asleep. I just woke up the next day and went on about my business as normal, with no ill effects, and I never saw it again. But I also never forgot it, because it was really, really odd. My family and I, me, my husband, my three-year-old daughter, and two-month-old son, moved into a rental home in College Station, Texas. This home was built in the 70s. About a month after living in our home, our daughter, who has always slept well through the night, started waking us up multiple times a night. One night, she woke us up by climbing into our bed crying. We let her sleep with us, and in the morning, she said that she saw a ghost with a blanket over their head. My husband and I thought it was a dream, because most kids see ghosts depicted in shows with a white sheet over their head. Then, a few weeks after that, I woke up in the night to feed my son. I put him back in his bassinet by our bed, and was laying in bed facing his bassinet trying to fall back asleep. I then see a figure the size of my daughter, with a blanket over their head, walk by the bassinet, look at my son, and run out of the room. 
Mind you, our daughter never just comes in and leaves without saying anything. I thought it was strange, so I got up to check on her. She is sound asleep in her bed. Then, a few nights later, I feel a tickle on my toes at night in bed. One time when my daughter and I were having a disagreement, the light started flickering. I have always believed in the supernatural, but my husband has always been a skeptic, until he saw it himself. One night laying in bed, he felt a brush on his arm and saw a figure by his bedside run off. He got up to check on our daughter and she was dead asleep. I called my mom one day to tell her about all of this and she said that she saw the same spirit in her home. She was babysitting my daughter one weekend at her home and got up in the night to get some water. She saw a small child in the dark hallway and went to check on my daughter who was dead asleep. Do we have a child ghost in our home? Is it following my daughter? How can we get the history on our rental home? It's very interesting. Before I tell this story, I just want to preface it by saying this isn't scary. I've never believed in ghosts, and even after all of this, I still don't believe in ghosts. With that said, a part of me wants to believe that none of this is coincidence, and I still thought that whatever it was, it was worth sharing. In the spring of 2019, my grandpa was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. When he found out, he gave my mom an acre of his land where an old barn used to be. A car and some tools and other valuable stuff was there too. A few months after he was diagnosed, we all knew he was close to his last day, so the whole family gathered at his house to be with him in his final moments. The moment he passed away, the light in the living room flickered. We all noticed it, but nobody said anything about it because we were preoccupied with hugs and crying. After that, we shared memories, talked for a while, and went home. We all met up there the next day since we kind of just wanted to be around our family while we mourned. After saying hi to everyone, I ended up sitting next to my great aunt, my grandpa's sister, and we were just sharing memories. At some point, she brought up the lights flickering right when he passed, and as soon as the word flickered came out of her mouth, the lights flickered again. We all looked at each other in amazement, and then she said, Brad, if you're watching over us, please give us a sign. And sure enough, the lights flickered again. Those of us who were there all kind of laughed, and I felt a wave of relief, as it was the first time I'd heard anyone laugh in days. We went about the rest of our day as normal, and I went home. My mom, grandma, younger sister, and a couple of my younger cousins decided to stay the night. Apparently, at some point in the night, my grandparents' radio turned on at full volume, playing a tape my grandpa had of his favorite radio show from back in the 50s. I'm sure they thought it was weird and related it to my grandpa, but apparently they just went back to sleep. Later that night, the TV turned on with my grandpa's favorite show from his childhood, American Bandstand, turned on, which he also had a CD or recording of. This woke everyone up, and apparently it made my mom and grandma cry. They think it was my grandpa letting them know that he's okay and that he's watching over them. That was the last strange thing that happened for a while. About a year later, my grandma decided it was time to move out. So she had an estate sale and sold the house to a single mom. It was hard for her to let go, but she was happy knowing that it was going to a family in need. As far as I knew, everything was going good there, until my mom decided to sell the acre of land that my grandpa had given to her. I recently got my real estate license, so they asked me to list it. But to go ask the woman who bought the house if she wanted to buy it or do a land contract before I put it on the market. I didn't have her number, so I went to her house and knocked on the door. When she opened it, I explained who I was and asked if she wanted it. She thanked me for the offer, but declined. 
She said that she would, but that she's trying to move out of the house as soon as she can. Looking at her as a potential client, I started to question where she was looking to move, and I asked why she wanted to move. She seemed hesitant to tell me why, but I asked her if there was anything wrong with the home. She told me that she has heard footsteps and other weird sounds in the house, and that she just needed a change. I thought it was weird that that was enough for her to want to move out, but I brushed it off. I got her number and told her that I'd be happy to help her sell the house and help her find a new home. She's still living in the house, but as we've talked more, she has opened up about why she's moving. Apparently, she's heard what sounds like a man crying in the basement about a dozen times since moving in, and it scares her kids so badly that they started sleeping in her room every night. She's tried figuring out what makes the noise, but the sound always stops when she opens the basement door. I've thought about asking my grandma if she's ever heard that noise before, but I'd hate to make my grandma think about something like that. I'm still working with this woman, and we have just listed the house, so I'm hoping that once she gets a new place, her kids will be comfortable again. Now, like I said in the start, I still don't believe in ghosts. I have been an atheist since I was a young teenager, and I always chalk everything up to something logical. Maybe the tapes playing in the night were someone accidentally rolling onto the remote in their sleep. Maybe the sounds are pipes or something. Maybe the lights flickering was because it's an old house. I definitely like to believe that it's my grandpa communicating, but that's just not me. My grandma, or nanny as we called her, spent her last days in a hospital with my mom, dad, sister, sometimes me and others by her side. We were all very close to her, even though she lived alone. She was very tidy and her house was pretty immaculate. My parents' house, where I lived at the time, was often messy, but on the rare occasion she would visit, I think maybe a period of a decade may have passed between visits, the house would need tidying in advance. But we had one or two rooms in this big house where clothes and odds and ends would pile up, and so naturally, we'd keep this room shut when she visited, if she visited, which was super rare. And so, when she became less capable of living alone due to a medical condition, she moved in and lived with us for a few weeks before going to the hospital where she passed away. During my grandma's stay at our house, she would sometimes tour the house unaccompanied, and on one of those occasions, she ventured into a junk room. She didn't say anything to anyone, but I heard her talking to herself in a displeased manner when I caught her wandering in there. This room, by the way, was the room next to my room. I'm time-wise aiming to be as accurate as I can because I'm not 100% sure exactly, but this was either the night of her passing or the following night. I'm asleep and I wake up around the witching hour. My eyes are open, but I don't move or need to go to the bathroom or anything. My eyes are just open. That's strange, because this kind of unjustifiable awakening never happens. I'm a really light sleeper too, and I almost always know what wakes me up. Well, as I lay there for a moment, I hear something from the room next door to mine. A noise at the time I couldn't care to catch. I thought literally nothing of it and closed my eyes to go back to sleep. When I hear again, nearly immediately, the same sort of noise. It was a shuffling sound. I closed my eyes and this happens a third time. Now I am awake awake. No one else but my sleeping parents are in the house. I keep listening. The noise sounded as though old magazines and odds and ends were either being thrown around or tidied, maybe even knocked over at times, I don't know. It was that third time that got my attention and made me think of her and her connection to it. She was always wanting that place to be tidied, so maybe she finally had an opportunity to do it. For me, to go anywhere else in the house meant I had to walk past that room as my bedroom was at the end of the corridor, and I always think of her when I do.
Whenever I tell this story, people call me crazy or tell me that my grandparents' house is haunted. But to be honest, this stuff only happens to me and it's only happened three or four times that I can think of. It was a normal day. I was hanging out at home, waiting for my mom to come home on her lunch break. It was about 30 minutes before she got home that I was watching SpongeBob or Hannah Montana that had happened. At the time, it scared the hell out of me since I knew that I was home alone with all the doors locked. But I felt a hand on my shoulder. Then I smell a smell that I haven't smelled in years, followed by a voice that made all the hairs on my body stand up. It was my great grandma. She said, I'm here, Miha. I'm always here. I love you. As for the smell, it wasn't until a month or so later that I put together what it was. My grandma had wanted to have a vial of my great grandma's old perfume in the home. I smelled that and it reminded me of the smell that I had smelled when I felt the hand. And then I remembered that that was what my great grandma always wore. To this day, everyone brushes this story off or asks me why out of all the family members she would visit me. I don't know. I just know that she did. It was about 7 p.m. during a terrible thunderstorm. My mom was working late at night at my school for some project. She brought me, my sisters, and my sister's friend along with her because there was no one at home to watch us. I don't know where my mom took off to to finish this project, but my sisters and I all walked into our school gym. We were very bored, so we just wandered around the gym jumping on the bleachers and doing stuff that kids would do at a time like that. We all decided to sit down and tell some funny stories to pass the time, but that laughter soon turned into terror. We all noticed one of the lights flickering on and off, and as it did, it was going into some kind of pattern. It was kind of scary, but we didn't think much of it, until every single light in the gym started flickering on and off in the same pattern altogether. We freaked out and started panicking. Keep in mind, this was during a huge thunderstorm. As we were trying to run outside of the gym, we saw something. It took just one flash of lightning for us to see a figure of an old lady standing right in the middle of the gym. We ran out of the gym in terror as we didn't even know what we had just witnessed. And to this day, I still wonder who or what it was that we saw that night. My grandfather died in 1995 due to emphysema and other health concerns. He was in his early 60s and left us prematurely as he had many people who loved and depended on him, including many young grandchildren. I was only four years old, almost five at the time when he passed, and I don't remember much from this darker period of my life. But I remember his funeral vividly. I was in a funeral home that had multiple parlors and many hallways throughout the building. I remember being outside of his parlor and seeing him across the room. We locked eyes. I walked over to him, after all he was my grandpa, and at the time my young mind hadn't computed that he was dead. We began our usual as we were two peas in a pod and had a very special relationship. We held hands and walked through the halls. Much of the conversation I don't recall, but I do remember showing him the lounge area as that was his favorite place to be, what with all the snacks and vending machines. As we approached that area that we had met at, we stopped and he said to me, Michael, I have to go now. He had vanished, literally leaving my hand empty in the air. I can still see my empty hand and I remember the shock and confusion that I felt. 
The part that helps me to think that this was an authentic experience, and this is something that my grandmother, aunt, and mother all remember, is that as I approached the open casket, my mother picked me up. I see my grandpa there, in peace, and I begin, confused, to relentlessly ask why grandpa was in a casket and what was wrong with him. My mother told me, crying, and I remember this clearly, Michael, honey, he is dead. He's gone, and he's not coming back. I was in disbelief, arguing. I kept saying, no, no, I just saw him. He's outside. After this, I remember us all crying together, but that's all. I never spoke about it until I was 12 or 13 years old. I was at my grandmother's, and her health was wavering at the time. I had been thinking about it a lot, with her being in that same state, and having memories of my experience, and I finally broke down and told them what I remembered. Again, we cried, and they couldn't believe that I could remember that, or that I had held on to it through all those years of childhood. They, in a way, directly corroborate the experience for me, at least solidifying it in my head as a final goodbye from one of my favorite human beings as they remembered the scene at the casket. They said that it caused concern for them for years. They were always too afraid to ask me about it, maybe to protect me from emotional anguish. My grandmother, for the remaining year or so that she had with us, would always ask me to tell her the story any time I would visit her. She also claims to have woken up one day, feeling my grandfather laying next to her. She said that she could feel it was him, as if she went to bed next to him and they had woken up together. She never told anybody that until I shared my story. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed my story. It's one that I will never forget. Okay, I'm an old guy. I'm 60 years old and this probably happened in 1968 or 69. My parents bought an 1860 Victorian home. It was rather large. We had eight kids, so we needed a big place. My bedroom was upstairs, adjacent to my parents' bedroom, which I hated. The house had a central attic, and there was a rear attic too that was part of an addition built before 1900. The only entrance to the attic was a trap door, in my bedroom. My bed was over to the farthest distance to the door in the ceiling, not a pull-down door, more of a heavy wooden rectangular lid that had to be pushed over and sideways to clear the portal. Every night, I would just lay in bed and look at that hatch in the ceiling, and I would start to see it move a little. No noise, just staring at it too long seems to make me see it moving. Like a single light on a ceiling will appear in a dark room. If you look at it for too long, it starts to look like it's moving. So I just thought it was me. I was only in that room for a year or so. I was also a bed rocker. It's a sleep disorder where kids end up asleep on all fours and they rock with head and pillow butt up forwards and backwards. I would rock so hard that the bed would move across the room. I'm sure it freaked my parents out. I did this until I was like 10 years old. This was in the 60s. No doctors consulted, no Fs given. One early morning, the light from the sun started illuminating the room. I remember I had woken up and was in that rocking position, and I must have fallen back into my sleep rock trance. Suddenly, something hit my butt, like a medium force slap. I was immediately awake, now lying flat with the sheet over my head. There was a glass panned door in my room and my parents' door just down the hall was squeaky. Plus the oak floors make a lot of noise if anybody's in the hallway. But I hadn't heard a single sound. No doors, no floorboards. 
I laid under my covers for a good hour or two, breathing heavily. I asked around the house to see if maybe my siblings had been messing with me. They said that they didn't. And my parents had no idea what I was talking about. Really freaked me out. Might have cured my sleeping disorder, who knows. And it motivated me to take a bedroom far away from that hatch in the ceiling. After I did, nothing ever happened again. This is the one strange experience that I've had. I'm not saying that it was a ghost, but whatever it was, it was frightening. The last time that I truly experienced paranormal activity, I was probably eight years old. I am now 25 and unsure of what I'm hearing and seeing, so I guess I'm just looking for opinions. The house that I live in has been in my husband's family for a few years. It's pretty modern, nothing 1800 style or anything. Just a few weeks ago, my husband told me that he started hearing what were clear footsteps late at night in our kitchen and our bedroom. Typically, I'm asleep pretty early, as our two-year-old, let's call her Lucy, shares the bedroom with us for now to save a little bit of space and money. So given that, I was unaware of what was happening. At first, I thought he was joking. A few weeks go by, and out of nowhere, Lucy gets out of bed and stares at the closed bedroom door. She starts to smile and laugh. Then she begins waving and she says, Mommy, look, it's Daddy. My husband was nowhere in sight. Strange? Yes, but I wanted so badly to believe that maybe she was just playing around. A few hours go by and everybody is asleep except for my husband and I. I go to the bathroom for a moment, and as I'm sitting in there, this powerful gust of cigarette smell came out of nowhere. Nobody in the house smokes. I quickly finished up and proceeded to the bedroom to tell my husband to come and smell it. And by the time I had walked in, and the 10 seconds it took him to get to the kitchen and bathroom, the smell was completely gone like it was never there. My husband said all he could smell was my hair conditioner. At that point, I think that he thought I was crazy. We went back to the room and I kept the door cracked and sat down at my computer. As I was looking through the door, I saw and heard our electric trash can open and close when it was completely shut down. We hear footsteps walking away, but there's nobody there. I don't really know how else to describe all the other vibes that I've gotten from this place recently. Are we just going crazy? I think I've started to doubt my own sanity. I'm not really sure what we're going to end up doing. I mean, if it is a ghost, as long as it's not harmful, I guess I don't really see an issue. But the one thing that really got me was that putrid smell, how strong it was. But then how the second I called my husband in, it just disappeared without a trace. I just don't know. Most of my paranormal experiences happened when I was younger, and I had quite a few while I was in university. I had a friend, Erin, who claimed that she regularly saw and was followed by numerous spirits, and that she would try to help. I had quite a few experiences at her apartment. The first time was during my first spring break. I was staying in my best friend Stephanie's room while she was out of town and staying with her roommate, Aaron. It was early in the day. I went to leave my bags in Stephanie's room and I noticed the closet door was open. I closed it and went to Aaron in the main room. 
I hear a creak. I look to Erin, who started to smile, and I ask what that sound was. She told me to go close the closet door again. I did, and I made sure that it was firmly shut. Upon leaving the room, I heard the door open again. Erin started laughing. I went back again, really making sure the door was shut tightly. I walked out of the room yet again, and the door opened once more. Aaron says to me, now, go turn on the closet light and close the door. I did, and it stayed shut. Aaron smiles at me and says, I guess Stephanie forgot to tell you that he doesn't like the dark. If you want the door closed, the light needs to stay on. This was before the age of cell phones, so I emailed Stephanie, who confirmed the situation, and apologized for not telling me, but assured me that he was a very nice spirit. Who he was, why he was there, how he got there, I never really knew, especially since it wasn't an old building or anything. But it was definitely wild. I worked as a caregiver on the night shift at a long-term care home. I had a resident ring the bell at 2.59 a.m. I went in and asked her what she needed, and she proceeded to yell at me, telling me there was a man in her bathroom and I needed to get him out. We did have people who would wander into other people's rooms, so I wasn't too put off by it. I asked her what the man looked like and she said he was a black figure that had no face. I calmed her down and then called in to whoever was in the bathroom that they had to leave her alone. I then went back to my charting. At about 3.10, I had another call bell ring, but from the other side of the floor from where the first bell had gone off. I went into this resident's room, and this particular resident would always ask for pain medication around this time. So at first, I just figured it was routine. I asked if he needed his medication, and he said, and I quote, there's a creepy man in my room with no face. You need to get him out. My blood ran cold, and I had a nurse stay with me on the floor for the rest of my shift. I definitely had some other strange experiences working that job, but that one is what made me stop working the night shift. When I was 13, my older brother, who was 18, and I were on our way to a movie when we were hit by a drunk driver. I woke up in the hospital four days later, having lost my right leg and having my other leg in a cast, along with other injuries. That night, I woke up to my brother sitting by my bed, telling me that everything would be okay and to go back to sleep, so I did. The next day, my parents came to visit me, to see how I was doing. I asked why my brother hadn't come with them, and they looked at each other but just didn't really say anything. That night, I again woke up to my brother sitting by my bed, telling me he knows that I'll get through this and that I need to be strong and overcome all of this, and not to let my injuries stop me from living my best life. We talked for a little bit, him not answering any specific questions, but agreeing to answer more general ones. I asked him why he was still wearing the same clothes that he'd been wearing the day before, because it was very unlike him to wear anything similar to what he had worn the day before. He didn't answer that. But when asked how he was doing, he said he was better than he thought he would be, given the circumstances. He reminded me to be strong and to keep living, and not to let anything stop me. He told me he loved me very much and that I should get some sleep. So again, I went back to sleep. That next day, my parents came again to visit me in the hospital, 
and again I asked why my brother hadn't come with them. Again, they looked at each other. Finally, I said, you know, I'd really like family to visit all together, and not at different times. I wish my brother would come visit me during the day with you so we can talk more instead of at night. My dad asked me what I was talking about. I said, well, Andy's been coming at night to visit me and talk to me, but he never comes with you. I don't understand. My mom broke down and left the room. My dad then told me that what I was telling him was impossible because Andy had died instantly in the accident. I didn't believe it and argued, and I got so upset I had to be sedated. That night, I had no visit, and the next day my parents brought newspaper articles about the accident. Years later, my fiancé had an experience, and having never seen a photo of my brother, described him to a T and what he was wearing. That's a story for another time, but it was nice knowing that my brother is still around looking out for me and for those that I love. In 2013, my wife and I divorced and we both moved into separate homes. The divorce went well and we're still good friends to this day partly because we have a daughter together. We agreed to split custody over our daughter and I rented an old house in a historic district in the city where we live. It was a very pretty home, built in 1935, but kept up very well. I would have my daughter two weeks at a time and she had a bedroom in the back of the house. She was three years old at the time and I kept noticing her talking to her friend. One day, I found her in a little closet, talking to somebody, and I remember her saying that she was talking to another little girl named Betty. I have no idea where she heard the name Betty, because she was only three years old, and that's not a name of anybody we know. But I just chalked it all up to a child's vivid imagination. Keep in mind, I'm a single dad to a little girl. I really have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to dressing, hair, or just little girl stuff in general. Her mother is really good at that stuff, but not me. I put my daughter to bed one night after her bath. I remember brushing her hair out that night, but that was all I did. The very next morning, her mom came to pick her up from my house, and my daughter was just waking up. Her mom went back to her bedroom to find my daughter's hair was fixed into two perfect French braids. Her mom was really proud of me at first that I had done her hair so cute, but I said, I can't do that. I can't even braid her hair, much less do French braids. We asked our daughter how her hair got fixed, and she told us that Betty had done it during the night. I broke the contract on the rental agreement and moved out within the next month. I bought my first house in 2003 and I was over the moon. Shortly after moving in, Two of my neighbors began joking with me about the ghost in my house. Well, I thought they were joking, so I just played along, pretending I had seen one and that it was no big deal. Well, as time went on that summer, I met more and more of my neighbors, and they all brought up the same topic. Finally, an elderly woman on the block who was quite kind and friendly told me the story after I asked her what everybody was on about. I knew she wasn't going to screw with my head, which is why I asked her in the first place. It turns out the previous owner purchased the home and never lived there because she said it was haunted. Sounds in the night of footsteps and sobbing and glimpses of a man sitting in the kitchen covered in blood. One of my neighbors helped with the renovations of the house and said that he was putting up drywall 
when he felt something lift up his dreadlocks. Though I've had paranormal experiences before, it had been years, and by then, I had just chalked it all up to night terrors. One day, I went to a small neighborhood video store to rent a movie. I had to fill out a form with my demographic data and my credit card info. The owner of the store looked at the form and said, oh my God, you live in that house. I asked her what she meant and she explained that her former employee had committed side in my house. She came to the house as soon as she had heard, but the house had been taped off. It was a potential crime scene before they knew. She told me that he had just moved into the house with his partner and called his mom because he wanted to invite her over to meet his partner and come out to her. This was in the early 90s, so it was a different time. His mother told him she already knew that he was gay and she disowned him over the phone. It was a really painful time for him. That same week, he apparently had received a letter from an HIV testing center stating that he had tested positive for the virus. Again, this was when that was pretty much a death sentence. He sat at the kitchen table, ate a bowl of cereal, and then committed suicide with a revolver. Since then, she has had multiple paranormal experiences in the store, with videos flying off of shelves and even levitating off of shelves. The most I have experienced were sounds at night, sounds of Cheerios being poured into a bowl. I don't eat cereal, so I don't even have it in the house. And the sounds of sobbing in the kitchen. I often awaken to both. Now, it all makes sense. I remember that my grandmother said, when the dead come to you, they want something. Perform an act of charity in their name and pray for them. So I did. I sat down at the kitchen table one night and I lit a candle and I told him that each night I would recite a novena prayer for him before I lit a candle. On the ninth night of the first novena to Saint Anthony, the patron saint of lost souls, I heard uncontrollable sobbing. I felt a strong presence of grief and despair and the sound of hyperventilated breathing as though somebody couldn't catch their breath. I sat in the presence of this, knowing that it meant no harm, but that it was a connection and compassion that he was in need of. For 45 days, I said a novena prayer before I lit a candle for his soul and had a mass said in his name. A few times I had awakened to feel his presence standing by my bed, but I knew that he was probably just saying hi or thanking me. It never felt malicious. It still happens from time to time, but the crying has stopped and he shows up less and less frequently. And I hope that means that he's found some peace. In the early 80s, I lived in Okinawa, Japan. My dad thought that seeing the world would be an adventure that would help my brother and I become better men. And I have to say, I think he was right. Being in the military showed me cultures that many would never get to experience. And I am thankful for every experience that that life gave to me, even the scary ones. While we lived in Japan, my father wanted us to have a fully immersive experience, so he chose to move us into a small Japanese neighborhood off base. We lived in a little house at the top of an enormous hill in a cul-de-sac that overlooked, I kid you not, part of a huge zoo, and on one side, a fairly large cemetery. Our particular house was set far above the monkey habitats, about a mile downhill. Between us and those habitats was nothing but thick Indiana Jones style jungle. Jungle the neighborhood kids and I would tromp through endlessly, ignoring the local warnings about poisonous snakes and ancient untripped mines from World War II. 
We were the only American family living in that cul-de-sac, completely surrounded by Japanese families, and it was amazing. The kids loved us, and although we couldn't communicate through language very well, we understood each other perfectly. Well, most of the time. Opposite us was an older couple with a lush garden surrounding their property. The older woman wanted us to call her Mama-san, and she had us helping her garden whenever she could coax us over with green tea and chocolate banana cookies. We loved her. She was so welcoming and generous, as was everyone else, actually. We lived in a wonderful neighborhood. The only drawback to Mama-san's home, though, was that she directly overlooked the cemetery. And that cemetery was unlike any cemetery I had ever seen before. Because Okinawa is an island, burials don't happen that often. Instead, above-ground crypts are built, many of them built into the sides of the hills that make up the island. The crypts are large, made of huge arcs of polished stone set over a large square of that stone, which has a square insert cut into the middle of it for the coffin to be placed inside. Once inside, the square is inset with another piece of polished stone, leaving a kind of shelf on the outside, so offerings could be made to lost loved ones. Yen, food, flowers, incense are some of the offerings given. Below Mama-san's house was a valley that swooped back up into another hill opposite her home. That valley and both hills were covered with these crypts, and spider webbing up and down through the crypts were various stone step pathways that were very old and badly maintained. It was quite a sight. One evening, Mama-san asked me to come visit with her, alone. She had something to show me, but it was only for me as the older brother. Intrigued and a bit proud, I agreed. She took me to the back of her garden and sat me on a thick wooden bench that was carved with scenes of fishermen and men with swords and told me she had a story to tell. Mama-san then disappeared for a few minutes and soon returned with a tray that held hot green tea and sweet rice cakes. Sitting next to me, she smiled and commented on the colors of the evening sky as the sun began to lower. Mama-san said that she had seen me, my brother, and some other kids daring each other to follow a stairway path down into the cemetery. You have to understand, the path from our little home area down to the cemetery consisted of hundreds of steps, many broken or cracking, and in and out of bushes and at a steep incline. It would be dangerous for anybody, but the real test was seeing how long we could take walking through the crypts at night. Mama-san wanted to explain why that was a bad idea. Many years ago, during the war, Americans were thought to be devils, monsters that would murder innocent citizens for no reason other than to kill. That fear was the product of wartime propaganda, used to encourage young men to military service and farmers to fight alongside them. But many didn't. Many ran. And with nowhere to go and nowhere to hide, hundreds of Japanese citizens hurled themselves off of a cliffside rather than face torture at the hands of their perceived enemy. I was terrified at hearing this. I had no idea this had happened. I was mortified and hit with such sadness that I started to cry. The sun was setting and the sky went from pink and blue to a deep orange and red. Mama-san reached out and held my hand, telling me not to worry. This was all in the past, and the past is something we must always remember so that we never go back. She went on with her story. One young woman had followed through with this sacrifice with her two children, but she survived the fall. She was in a coma for months. When she did regain consciousness, she was horrified to realize that she was not with her children. They had been buried somewhere in that cemetery below, 
in an unmarked crypt that held many others. The woman would spend days and nights searching the cemetery, crying in pain, the torment of her loss unbearable, until the day that she threw herself into the ocean to hopefully be reunited with her lost family. But they say that she never found her children. Her act of unaliving herself doomed her to purgatory. She would remain tortured for all eternity. The sun had disappeared. The cemetery drowned in inky blackness. The main path dotted with dim, broken lights, feebly illuminating small areas. Mama San continued. She still wanders the cemetery, she said, looking for her kids. You can hear her crying. And then she pointed down. I didn't want to, but I did. I looked. In the back of the cemetery, in the darkness, there was a white figure. At first, a bright white shimmer, moving slowly, kind of shaking. It moved from side to side, like it was moving among the crypts, and you could actually hear the crying, softly at first, but then low moans and whimpers of pain as it got closer. I was terrified. I wanted to run, but Mama San held my hand and whispered that she wouldn't come up here. We were too far. But that is why we shouldn't go down there after dark. She said that many people don't know her story and call her the White Witch, which angers her. It's best to stay away. It's best to pray for her. Mama San said that she comes out to see her often, hoping one day she will find her salvation. Needless to say, I never went down to that cemetery. Not once. And I never sat back there with Mama San again either. That was enough for me. I did, however, visit Side Hill. It's called Peace Prayer Park now, out of respect. And I cried the whole time we were there. I prayed for all the souls and for forgiveness. So many Japanese citizens spoke to us welcoming us, telling us stories, and sharing with us. I didn't feel worthy, and my love for the country and its people was overwhelming. I'll never forget my time there, and I'd like to go back, to see everybody, and to see if she's still there, wandering the graves, looking for her children. My daughter has recently been telling me about her papa and how she misses him a lot. For context of who she's referring to, it'd have to be my grandfather, who I often called papa until he passed away four years ago. We have pictures of him in albums and his artwork in one of our rooms, but we haven't had many proper conversations about him yet. A few days ago, out of the blue, she told us that she had seen him. She told us what color shirt he was wearing, and what his hair looked like. Which isn't really that much to go on, because, you know, it's just her imagination, right? She did tell us what he did for work, and that she was sad that he was last in a hospital. He did pass away in a hospital, something that she really has no reason to know. She has been getting very tearful and upset lately about missing him and it's taking her a very long time to calm down from being so upset. If we had always spoken about him, and she was very much aware of the fact that he was around and now he isn't, or that he passed away when she was alive or something, I could have made the connection. But this, this is just weird. It all started about three days ago. My boyfriend and I were home with our dogs and cats when I heard some kind of cat fight going on. 
I said to my boyfriend, oh, I hope there's not a stray cat fighting with our cat. We need to go check. So I go outside and he goes to get his shoes on and he comes around the other way. The whole time we're hearing these stressed out meows, but my outdoor cat isn't acting weird. It sounded like it was under my house, then in the detached garage, then in my neighbor's house. So we went back inside. We heard it for a few more minutes, but my indoor cats weren't acting strange either. And then it went quiet. Then last night, my boyfriend was in the kitchen making hot dogs, and I was standing on the other side of the kitchen talking to him, when all of a sudden we heard a boom. He asked what it was, and I looked at my cats. They were close to the hall, but they were on the other side of some things, so I couldn't see them clearly and just assumed it was them. So I said, oh, it was just the cats. But then he was walking that way and turned the light on in the hallway and a bottle of spray was on the floor that I had previously used and put inside a bag that's hanging on a hook in the hall. I thought it was strange that it was in the middle of the hallway now. So my boyfriend casually asks if anybody was there, like somebody living. When we got no reply, he asked if there was a spirit there and to please leave and all the rest of it. Nothing happened for the rest of the night. Then came this morning. Our nine week old puppy jumped over the boxes that were blocking the hallway and was just whining and jumped back over and hid and whined again. It did this a few times in a row, so we took him outside and back in and he calmed down. But that's the same place that the cats had been when we heard that bang. Anyway, my friend came by to bless the house and cleanse it with sage. Hopefully, it works. So, my friends and I were all hanging out. There were about five of us at first, and later only four. Due to a power outage, we resorted to playing board games and such with candles and flashlights. My sister suggested that we try to summon ghosts and things like that, as a joke or just to have some fun and occupy the time. We all decided to go along with it for the time being and started joining hands and inviting spirits to join us or whatever we had read online about how to summon things. We did this multiple times in two separate rooms. And at first, nothing really happened. Then we started to hear noises, but it could have been creaks or knocks from the house being old. But then I started to become convinced that it wasn't just coincidence that we would only hear these noises whenever we asked for signs. We weren't getting much, so we all just started to hang out and started talking in the family room like a normal hangout. After a while, everyone in the room froze and stopped talking as my bathroom door at the end of the hallway slammed shut. Everyone was quiet and I started getting excited because we actually had proof of something. So now everybody in the room was on board that something was with us. It was pretty undeniable at that point. Our fifth friend ended up leaving after this, so it was just the four of us left. We came to the conclusion that a majority of the activity was coming from around the hallway, so we all decided to move into the hallway and try to communicate with whatever was there. We sat down and asked for signs again. Our friend said that he heard noises from the kitchen, but none of the rest of us did so we asked for more signs. Then, clear as day, all of us heard a noise like a sigh, and everyone freaked out. Everyone had to calm down, and as we calmed down, we just decided it would be best to leave the house. So far, I haven't been back there, so I don't really know what happened or if anything else has been going on, but it was definitely pretty wild.
Recently, I had a spirit box session with my girlfriend, and it really changed my view of the paranormal. We bought a spirit box that has a built-in temperature measurement device, basically makes sounds according to how big of a difference there is and lights up and flickers red if there's an increase in temperature or blue if there's a decrease. I'm in my bedroom and it's just me and my girlfriend with the window open. I could feel the cold air on my feet, the spirit box on my lap. I asked for an increase in temperature and it delivered. We had some intelligent responses during the whole three hours or so, a lot of them really personal. We're sort of a new couple, six months or so, and it is really possible that we were talking with my girlfriend's great grandma. She said, write it down. My girlfriend told me to open my notes on my phone. I did, and the same voice told us some personal things that I didn't actually know about my girlfriend's family, but she said was true. The LED was glowing red for like two solid minutes. After a while, I asked for a blue light, and no more than 10 minutes later, it was glowing blue. A male voice was even caught saying, there's a draft. So I closed the window and soon after, it was blue again. Before all of this, we went to a basement that every flat in the building shares. My girlfriend was previously uneasy and felt like she was being watched and that there was a dark energy there. About five months ago, I tried an EVP session in there, but I didn't get a single strange noise or voice. Today, I had headphones and couldn't hear a single voice around me. Then a deep male voice said the name Kuba, which is Jacob in my language multiple times. One even said, behind you. About two minutes after that, my girlfriend freaked out and repeatedly told me to get out of the basement, not explaining why. I myself kind of freaked out and we ran out. While closing the door, the same deep voice said, don't go, followed by a woman's half screaming, help. My girlfriend told me that she saw something dark and heard a growl behind me. While telling this story, I know that I would never believe it if somebody told me, but I was there and it was true. And I will never forget that spirit box session. I'm not going back to the basement, but I definitely plan to keep investigating to see what else we might experience. This happened in mine and my husband's first house, several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery. For the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving night lights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm, not hard, but firm, 
and he whispered, What the hell? while looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m. and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did, and he handed me another smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911 and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door. So when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son and sit. I was just rocking him back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer, not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable, still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first. I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, Let's go back to our room, or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out, saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better, but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house, really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time, I was wary of the room though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there. But I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled. But then in all sincerity, he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate, probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing, at least not in our house and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident, the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go now back to his mom's. Then we somehow just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. 
By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway, but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, Whoa, what's wrong? But I just turn his head to the upstairs, and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning, rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room, because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside, he's got a handful of stuff, and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling because he, my not scared of anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're gonna stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place, it's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it. He finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there, and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys, and haven't really looked back, other than to talk about Remember When, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house. Not even a little bit. To start off, I'm not really a believer in the paranormal. I mean, sure, creepy things do happen, but never to the point of me thinking that it was definitely a ghost or whatever. But one night, a few days ago, it was nearly midnight, and I was on my bed, thirsty during a heat wave. So I get up, ready to get a Gatorade, and I open my door. I see this black and brown shadow figure. It was crouching, was six to seven feet tall, and zoomed across my living room into my dining room. To top things off, my cat saw it, definitely, because the cat reacted. So I go get my Gatorade, cause ain't no demon gonna stop me from quenching my thirst, and I get back to my room and think about it. It couldn't have been my door, it opens inward, and it couldn't have been one of my cats. Here's the worst part. My stepdad lived in a house with some paranormal stuff going on. I thought maybe it followed him. Maybe he brought some kind of demon into the house. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm haunted. I really don't know. But another experience was at my dad's house. I was in my room at the end of the hall, and I heard the slider in the kitchen open. Keep in mind it's at night, and everyone is in their respective rooms. So. Being the guy I am, I take out a pocket knife and investigate. As soon as I open my bedroom door, the bathroom door next to my room slams shut. Now, I don't know if this could be connected to the first story, 
but it was really, really creepy nonetheless. I have no idea what's going on, but that's my story. I was working a part-time job at a church at the time of this event, and it was at the end of the day, so I was cleaning up and getting ready to lock it up for the day. For context, this church is very old, and there are graves on the property that date from the 1860s. The place has burned down twice. I go to the church's kitchen to grab my lunch bag from the fridge, and when I walk through the door, out of the corner of my eye, I see a woman at the counter to my right. I thought it was my boss, but the fridge was straight ahead, so I walked forward and grabbed my stuff. I turned around and there was no one there. I was alone in the kitchen and the door didn't open, but there was someone there. I made a conscious effort not to look because I'm kind of socially awkward. I thought about it and realized, wait, that woman was wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern on it. How on earth could that have been my boss? She only ever wears jeans and sweaters. I kind of freaked out and I went inside and locked up the church. And I told my friend about it who's been going to the church for a long time. I didn't tell him what she was wearing, just that I had seen a woman that I didn't recognize. He told me that people like to joke about the church being haunted, but that there was no way I saw a ghost in broad daylight like that. It was the light playing tricks on me. Sure. After my job was done, I forgot all about the interaction until I got a text from my friend. It said, bro, was that woman you saw working at the counter wearing a white dress with a pink floral pattern? I never described the clothing to him. So we both saw the same woman in the kitchen cooking. Our theory is that back in the day, the women would do all the work in the kitchen for church services. She must have been buried on the church grounds and she was just there, working in the kitchen for decades or even a century, continuing on with the work she had always done. Last Thursday in the early morning, my dog passed away. It was really hard on the family, and it was especially hard on me. I remember after the at-home euthanasia company picked her up, I sat down where she had last laid, and I just cried my eyes out. I remember wishing out loud that I could hold her one more time, to play with her, to pet her, to run around and just enjoy her company. After I felt better composed, I got up and spent the remainder of my afternoon looking at pictures of her with my girlfriend. Later that night, my mom came home and mentioned that there was a stray in the front yard. Although I was still grieving, I wanted to make sure that the dog outside got the right owner. Thankfully, it didn't take much to help out. She was timid, but a few treats sealed the deal. She came into my backyard willingly, and I started posting around to find the owner. She enjoyed my company from the get-go. She encouraged us to pet her and hug her. She latched onto me like a newborn puppy and followed me throughout the backyard. We weren't confident enough to let her in the house, so she slept outside. She slept, by choice, in the same spot that my dog would sleep. Apparently, the dog had been spotted at our neighborhood park and a family had been trying to get her for the past few days. They tried everything food, treats, snacks, but she wouldn't budge. The family asked how I managed to get her to come to me, and I just said that it didn't take much. They took her off my hands and checked her into the nearest vet. She left willingly and didn't look back. She was wagging her tail until she passed my block. I can't take her in because honestly, I'm not ready for a dog yet. However, it's crazy how a brief moment with this dog eased me in so many ways. Everyone I tell mentions that my dog probably sent over a guardian dog to ease me. That stray came to me readily and let me pet her, hold her, play with her, things no one else could get her to do. 
It's the last few things that I wish to do with Bay before she passed on. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. I was probably 10 to 12 years old, and my friend, I'll call him Bill, and I, were going over to another friend's house, I'll call him Jake, for a sleepover. I'll keep this brief, but this has always stuck with me, and I felt like sharing. We were all hanging out in the living room in the late afternoon. I wanted a drink, so I walked into Jake's kitchen. When you walked in, there was a table to your immediate right. I think it was Jake's birthday or something, so there were some balloons tied to the chairs. I looked over and I saw an old man sitting in one of the chairs. At least I thought I did. I only saw him for a split second, and I assumed I was just seeing things. Never mentioned it to my friends because it was honestly just a, oh, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. An hour or so went by, and Bill went to the kitchen for some food or whatever. When he came back, he told Jake and I that he saw a man sitting at the kitchen table. I got so excited because this was a damn sleepover and now we had ghosts involved. I told them that I thought I had seen the same thing earlier, and Jake said it sounded like his dead grandfather. Later that night, Jake's dad was working at the kitchen table before going to his bedroom. Once he was out of there, I went back to get some food, and I saw him still sitting at the table. I literally turned to ask, didn't you just leave? But there was nobody there. Some other things happened after that, but I kind of chalked those things up to our overactive imaginations given the first thing. I have two reasons, though, to believe that this wasn't a ghost. Number one, maybe we mistook one of the balloons for a human head. Totally possible. Number two, maybe I did tell my friends what I saw the first time, and I'm just blocking that part out of my memory. This would make what Bill said seem totally unbelievable, because he was younger than me and probably just wanted attention. But I'm 90% sure I never said anything to them, because I really didn't think anything of it when I first saw it. The balloon thing has been my main theory. I'm not a believer or a disbeliever in the paranormal. This is the only story I have that could have been paranormal but it's really hard to tell what happened. These experiences happened two to three years ago. I was around 13 to 14 at the time. The first experience occurred to me and my younger sister. It was around nine o'clock at night, not too late, but we were folding clothes and I heard a faint knock. I asked my sister if she had heard the knock, but she said no. I just shook it off because I thought it might have been a relative or something. But about 10 minutes later, we hear the knock again, and this time my sister heard it too. This time it was way louder. I mean, you might think that that's not scary or creepy, but the knock came from our window, and the window is only accessible to someone in the home, because the window is in our backyard and no outsider has access to the backyard. We immediately bolted out of the room because we were frightened. The next experience happened only to me. It was also around 9 p.m. at night, and I had gone into the kitchen for a cup of water. While I was pouring water, I heard a loud knock on the living room window. I got so scared that I yelled for my mom, who was in the other room at the time. She checked outside, but all she found was a rock. Everyone who lived in the house at the time said that someone had gotten a rock and thrown it at the window as a joke, but I disagreed. I disagreed because the rock that my mom found was only in our front yard, and our front yard gate was closed at the time. You need a key to be able to open it. I don't know though, what do you guys think? Was it a ghost or a person? I 
I have absolutely no memory of this experience, but my mom does, and she told me the story. I was a little over two years old and had just started to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story about three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until judgment day or something like that. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman, who always talks way too loudly, was literally whispering by the end of it. And she was white as a sheet. I believed her completely, and I still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad that I can't remember it. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, who we'll call Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to the town from there. My mom said the first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, don't like mean house, mean house, ugly house, don't like, scary house, mama, don't like. My mom says this behavior was extremely out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now this house was ramshackle and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and until recently before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in causing a lot of damage. A lot of this damage wasn't fixed, so my young broke parents got a very cheap rental agreement, gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed that the only fire damage left was in the kitchen, since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level. Either way, the landlord was adamant that that room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked, 100%. I know all of this because I heard stories about the crappy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life, and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it, and both of my parents have told me that it did give them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix boss. She was hanging laundry and I was just rolling around with the dog. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, boss started going absolutely ape from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running toward my mom, then turning and running back to the pond barking frantically the whole time. That's when my mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off toward the water at full speed. Boss beat her there and drug me out of the water himself. Thanks, pupper. Love you. Although my mom was confused as to how I'd gotten so far so fast and how I had ended up in the center of the pond since it was way over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she just underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and playpens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor was asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen to hear us crying or fussing while she cooked. My mom said that no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again in the yard. She runs up to check on us. Victor's still sleeping. Every baby gate is shut and locked, but I am not in my room. A frenzied search revealed that I wasn't in the house at all. 
A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning caused my mom to rush outside to see what he was trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off toward the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother and wait for her to catch up a little before racing off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from the neighbors. He led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said that she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, I was just standing. She rushed over to me, and after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began questioning me on why I was there and how I'd gotten there. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking at a very young age, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said that I told her, with that serious look that only small children can give, that the children had brought me there. Shitting her pants a little at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her, through the kitchen, get me from upstairs, walk right back past her on the way down the stairs and out with me, all the way over here, she demanded to know what children and where the hell they were now. I looked at her dead serious and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs, I don't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there staring at her with a serious expression and my mouth closed. She said the same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me. So she was always left wondering and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was flat impossible. She says there's no way I could have even known it was out there, much less have had the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs, past her, and end up almost two miles down the road, all in under 15 minutes. I was only two, and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers. As I said, she's still shaken by it after 30 years. Personally, I have no idea what happened that day. I've thought about hypnosis, but haven't decided if I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever those things were, I really don't think they were children. Back in 2000, when I was 20, a friend of mine, a 19-year-old female, decided she wanted to get an apartment and asked if I would be her roommate. I didn't really need a place to stay, but I decided to do it anyway. We moved to a nice apartment complex right next to and behind the house where my aunt saw her dead ex-boyfriend. The place was nice and newer, so the thought of it being haunted never crossed my mind. I didn't even experience anything until my roommate got homesick a month in and had to move back in with her folks, leaving me there alone for three months. 
It started with the lights coming on by themselves. I would go to bed, always turning the lights off and always closing my bedroom door. I was meticulous about the lights because that's how I was raised. I would go to bed and at some point I'd open my eyes and see light coming in under the door. I thought my roommate came home, so I would get out of bed excited to see her, only to discover that I was still alone and the dining room or bathroom light would be on. Then the knocking started. Right after I would lay down, there would be three loud knocks on my bedroom door. Again, thinking my roommate came home, I'd get up to greet her, only to find that I was still entirely alone. A week or so before Christmas, my roommate and I went out gift shopping and went back to the apartment to wrap everything. When we were done, we were both standing at the door, checking to see if we had everything before leaving. The apartment was completely quiet and we heard this very clearly. My acoustic guitar, which I had leaned up against the wall in my bedroom with the pick stuck between three strings, was plucked, each string in succession then slid along the wall until hitting the floor. We just looked at each other, then walked to my bedroom to find the guitar on the floor with the pick still stuck between the strings. Those strings had been plucked, meaning the pick had been used and then replaced when done. At Christmas, during a party with her and some other friends at the apartment, the VCR turned itself off. It did that one or two other times while I was living there, but never before or after. For Christmas, my girlfriend got me a guitar tablature book for Pink Floyd's The Wall. One night, I sat on the floor of my bedroom learning how to play a song in it. When I was done, I put the pick in the strings and set my guitar up on the wall. But instead of closing the book as I normally did, I left it open and went to bed. Just after laying down, I heard the pages in the book flipping on their own. It was a thick book, but the song I had been learning was somewhere in the middle. I figured that the weight of the pages made it change pages on its own. But when they stopped flipping, I got curious and got up to look. The pages had stopped flipping on the song, Hey You, and when I read the title, I got chills and shut the book, pleaded with the ghost to let me sleep, and went back to bed. While laying there, I realized that if the pages had flipped on their own from the weight, they would have gone in the other direction, away from that song. After that, I started calling the ghost Pink. Anytime something happened, I would just say, oh, hey, Pink. But one night I had been out with a friend until around two o'clock in the morning. When I opened my door, I stepped in and I could feel the ghost standing there. I said, Oh, hi, Pink. And I could feel the energy go through me and out of the apartment. That's when I figured it didn't like being called that, which didn't stop me from saying it. Shortly after, my roommate came back and stayed the rest of the lease. Not much happened then. I figured if an entire house could be haunted, then surely an entire apartment building could be. I wanted to ask my neighbors if they ever experienced anything, but I never did. And actually, I never really talked to them at all. To answer some questions you might have, my roommate and I were and still are really good friends. We never dated, never slept together. She was also really good friends with my girlfriend, and it was my girlfriend who told her to ask me to move in with. Also, I've known since I was around 10 or so that I could feel ghosts, but usually only when standing right where they were. If I stand with them long enough, I usually get an image in my head of what they look like, as well as their mood. In a few instances, I've had them communicate with me like that, their words coming to me as thoughts or images, usually the latter. I typically don't tell people this, because they usually don't believe me, and I would rather not go through with the ridicule and name calling. However, with Pink, I never figured out who or what it was. I always felt that it was a male, but I didn't know. I still wonder about it from time to time.
My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me for probably 12 or 13 years. He was two grades below me and was a bad boy, while I was popular and in all honors and college level classes, so I wasn't aware he existed, until I met him at my dad's business about seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and teased that it would never happen, so that's why I mention this. In 2009, he and his best friend, I'll call him Josh, were getting into pills due to Josh's grandfather being an amputee and unable to properly attend to or understand the hiding of medications, thus leaving large amounts of all kinds of drugs just lying around. This was before the opiate crisis that has affected my generation deeply in the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas in 2009, Josh overdosed in the bedroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. It's a long story, but we moved back to our respective families because we were laid off during the pandemic and were in a bad wreck, losing the extra car. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it. But I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman that he waited for. I've woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moved right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time I've angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me, and I know when he's lying. He always says no. We like to think that it's Josh playing practical jokes, something he was well known for. But this is nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017. It wasn't a prank. It saved my life. Four years ago, I went into anaphylactic shock. I lost all ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved and steep staircase, separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing it could be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn, with very large, steep steps. I know I was extremely oxygen deprived, but I immediately saw Josh and two of my deceased best friends ascend the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911, but I had no voice. My friends were gone, except Josh. He told me he was going to wake my boyfriend from the hammock in the back of the yard. And suddenly, my boyfriend dreamed of his friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house, and by this point, I was dying. I could no longer use any part of my body, and no air came into my lungs when I inhaled. I remember thinking of my daughter and praying that her father would navigate my loss and that he would keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fading. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told him he didn't think I was breathing, and by some absolute miracle, there was an ambulance passing by my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were 30 minutes away. This coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition that I was hurt, saved my life. Josh and those EMTs saved my life. I remember the EMT asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed. I hadn't and I thought of how Josh had died. I was blabbering on about dead people saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMT were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs, or even stay alive long enough to get help. I had one bruise on my leg, which was tiny, and that was it, other than the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out I'm allergic to the latex spray paint that we were using. I told them that I slid down the stairs, but that's not how I remember it. The weird thing is, I had never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him or hallucinated him or whatever, but he looked exactly like the picture I was shown. I've had a lot of paranormal encounters, but my run-in with Josh saved my life, and he never even knew me. So thanks Josh for giving me more time on this earth, and I wish we had met many years before. I do hope he's resting peacefully, just periodically popping in to check on us.
We used to have a mimic when I was in college. People would hear or see me or my husband when we weren't there. After moving to our apartment in another state, we didn't have many experiences and assumed that it had stayed with the house. A couple of months ago, we moved into a different apartment and we've been having some odd occurrences. Things are moved around and reorganized. We hear or see each other when we aren't there. Stuff we used to see in our old place. The mimic has always been kind of helpful, so we don't really mind having it around. The first weekend in our new place, my shoes were organized without either of us touching them. Stuff I needed has popped up on the counters in plain sight. This morning, I was brushing my teeth as my husband was making coffee, and I heard him say, we're almost out of milk. I assumed he meant creamer since we don't have regular milk in the house and he was making coffee. When I went to make a cup, surely enough, we were almost out of creamer. I went into the home office and asked my husband if he had meant creamer before when I heard him say we were low on milk and he just gave me this weird face. He insisted that he never said that. My friendly neighborhood mimic, I guess, just wanted me to be prepared when I was going to make a cup of coffee. I had two friends named James and Sarah. Their basement was super creepy and a lot of weird things happened there. This is one of them. It was a random summer night just like any other, with the exception of some of the hauntings they had experienced getting more frequent and bolder, I guess you could say. James was watching TV downstairs while Sarah was taking a shower upstairs. While James was watching TV, he saw what he thought was smoke but it was in the shape of a person. It passed right between him and the TV. He didn't really give it much thought and assumed he was just seeing things. A few moments later, he heard a shriek and then what sounded like somebody running down the stairs, but only stepping on about every third step. It was Sarah, wearing only shorts and a sports bra. She bolted out of the house into her mom's house, which was the house in the front of the lot. James chased her to find out what was wrong. She finally calmed down and said, I finished my shower and I was laying on my back, playing on my phone. My feet were dangling off the edge of the bed. I thought I heard the bedroom door creak open a bit. I thought it was you, but no one was there. That's when I felt somebody grab my ankles and try to pull me off the bed. That's why I ran out of the house. They did not stay in the house that night. Sarah actually had bruises around her ankles in the shape of fingerprints. That house is creepy. They told me that at any given time in the night, you can hear people talking in the empty rooms. Shadow people peer around the doorways. Things move or disappear randomly all the time. James even caught a picture once of that smoke while there was nothing in the room. In one of the pictures, the smoke even has a face. I've no idea what's going on in that house, but I don't know how they live there. I used to work in a casino. One night, I was approached by an elderly woman, asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried to explain where to go, but she insisted that I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned that she was a medium and how her family has always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work at a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and generally odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked her how she knew my sister. She didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in her life that was impacting our family as a whole. 
I was skeptical, but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even became visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she had told me was undeniably accurate and insightful, but then she shifted her focus. She told me about somebody I worked with and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us and advised me to take caution. At this point, she had lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again, and I reminded her that I needed to get back to work and to keep walking toward our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked, and I began to once again find myself astonished, not just to what she was telling me, but also how she would go about it. Her body language, expressions, her emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well, and I turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum, above my belly button, just below where my rib cage started. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by, but everything seemed to be in slow motion, almost like I was leaving my body. It could have only been a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know. But I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and I felt weak in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. Casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her because I felt this shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and began apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them that everything was fine and they walked off. I turned back to the woman who was still apologizing and she said, if you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, but I told her thanks that I had to get back to work now and I quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I was noticeably completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words or the physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was way too afraid to get medical verification of an ulcer. I had already previously suspected it, and it was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time. But if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. The encounter happened nearly 10 years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. But recently, I was reflecting back on it. I realized that the second part about the coworker, the part that initially made no sense at all, all of a sudden did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years prior. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly seven years to the day from the moment that this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by seven years, but the person she had described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state at a whole other company at the time. I don't really know what to make of this. I'm open to this kind of thing, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. Still, I would love to hear what anyone else has to say about it and see what you might think it was.
I've had a couple of ghost encounters that really messed me up, but this one in particular was the worst. My mom was dating this guy, who wasn't like a super country guy, but not like a normal country guy either. He also had a son, who I still stay in close contact with to this day. Basically, almost every Sunday, we would go out to my stepdad's mom's house. She lived in the middle of the woods, but not too secluded, like there were other houses in the area. But directly across the dirt road, there was this abandoned house that pretty much looked exactly what you would expect an abandoned house to look like. My stepbrother and I would go in there every once in a while just for fun, and we would see some pretty weird stuff like a random chair in the middle of a room, a cooler full of dead roses. But one day, we were headed in there like usual, but I took one step in and I wanted to throw up. My stepbrother kept going and was telling me it was fine and to just come in, but I was not going in there. A couple of minutes of talking go by and all of a sudden my brother's face turns pale as hell. He drops his water bottle and he runs out without saying a word. I follow him, asking him to slow down, and he says that we're never going back in there again. When I asked why, he said that he heard a voice whisper in his ear and tell him to run. We never told our parents until like two years later. At the time, we were 12. And true to his word, we never went back in there again. My name is Luna, and I'm 35 years old, and I'm a hospice nurse. I've been a hospice nurse for the last 10 years. This is a story about a young woman I took care of that I became very close to. The patient in question was 23 years old and was dying of liver cancer. She was given about six months when she was told she was terminal and was put on hospice. I started going to her house twice a week at first, and we really liked each other. As she started slowly going downhill, I started coming more and more until I was there every day. Most of the time, we would just sit and talk. She was a very pretty girl with long black hair and blue eyes. She was very athletic and active before she got cancer, so not being able to do things for herself or get up and around without help was very hard for her. She always wore a minty smelling perfume, which I liked very much. I was with her the day she died, and that was a very hard day for me. I got home pretty late that day, and I made dinner for myself, and sat down in the living room in front of the television. I had been sitting there for about five minutes, when I smelled a minty smell that was just like my patient's perfume. Then I heard a cough, and a female voice call my name. I looked over toward the kitchen, and there was my patient standing beside the kitchen counter. She just looked at me and she was smiling and then she waved and disappeared. I think it was just her way of saying she was okay. Sometimes to this day, I still feel like she's watching over me. Sometimes I still smell her perfume, especially if I've had a hard day. My boyfriend passed at the end of March, and I haven't felt his presence until lately. I'm pregnant, and I've been in my nesting phase lately. I was setting up the bassinet and figuring out what sheets to buy, getting ready for bed. I put a blanket down in the bassinet because my cat likes to sit in it, not for when the baby gets here. And I looked out my window, which looks into my neighbor's closet. My neighbor has stained glass for privacy but I saw my boyfriend's silhouette in the window. I shook it off as somebody else in the closet, but when I looked back up a couple of minutes later, it was still there, with a hand pressed on the glass. I couldn't mistake it. It was him, down to the haircut. I started crying immediately. 
And then I smelled his scent and felt a warm, comforting feeling. It's been a couple of months since he passed, and I've always been sensitive to energy shifts in the paranormal. I found it weird that I hadn't felt his presence, but the closer I get to my due date, the more I feel him around. My family and I have always been animal lovers. I've never known a time when we didn't have cats or dogs with us, and I feel like they helped raise me. When my father was in college, he adopted two cats named Tigger and Sito. Tigger passed away due to a coyote, and after she passed, Sito was never the same. She was grumpy and preferred to be by herself, but I would annoy her with my love anyway. One night, I was carrying her in a wicker basket with some blankets. I would bring her room to room with me as I cleaned up. I had been petting her and listening to her purr when she suddenly stopped moving. I was maybe 12, and I remember praying for the first time to bring her back to me. It was awful to bring her out to my mom and tell her she had passed. I had a tradition that whenever a pet died, I would make a concrete headstone with little marbles and their name on it. I had set it on our kitchen counter to dry, and I left it there. The next morning, I checked on it and found a small piece of her fur right in the center. I went around to everyone and asked if they had placed it there, and they all said that they had not. It felt like she was giving me one last piece of her. I kept it in a tiny knick-knack tea kettle. It lives there with a few of her whiskers that I had found weeks after her passing. I feel like she came to give me one last gift. This happened over 30 years ago, so I'll explain the incident as best as I can remember. When I was three, my grandma on my maternal side died of a heart attack. While at the funeral, the adults were outside talking, smoking cigarettes, etc. Myself, my older brother, and another family member close to our age were told to stay inside to keep us out of conversations that we didn't need to hear, according to my parents. While the other family member convinced my brother that locking me in the viewing room with those red lights over the coffin on was a good idea. Once they locked me in, the other family member called through the door that grandma needed to take me with her because I was her favorite. I screamed and cried as loud as my little self could and some adults took me outside to my parents. I was told that they were just playing and that even though grandma loved me, she was never going to take me away. They were doing their best to soothe a very upset three-year-old. Later that year, we moved two states away from there. One night in the new house, four years later, I woke up in the middle of the night. According to my mom, this was very unusual. I heard a song that only my grandma sang to me. I sat up looking around and I see the lid on my old toy box opening by itself. Once it was fully open, I saw what looked like my grandma standing slowly from inside that box. She turned slowly and creepily around to look at me. I was frozen in place. I couldn't cry. I couldn't scream. I couldn't even move. Then she started walking toward me. She stepped close to the bed and said, I came to get you. You were always my favorite, and now I want you to be with me. Somehow I found my voice and screamed. My mom came running in, and just before she got to my room, my grandma said, I'll come back for you again, and vanished. My mother came in, asking who I was talking to. I told her everything. My mom let me sleep in the living room for a few nights while she got rid of my toy box. The toy box was the last thing my grandma had ever given me before she died. To this day, 
I have no idea what happened. All I know is that wasn't Grandma. So in 2019, my family and I are driving back from Narrabeen when we drove on Wakehurst Parkway. There's a legend about that road that a lady in all white is on it. And if you're not careful, she can appear inside your car. So we're driving back at around 9 p.m. and we're in the thick bush area. My mother, brother, sister, and I were asleep. My father was all alone. According to my dad, he was driving when he saw a lady all in white on the side of the road. He freaked out, but continued driving on. But then he saw the same lady two minutes later on the same side of the road. My father told us he was so freaked out that he tried to drive faster. Two minutes later, the same lady. After we got home, he told us what he had seen. And personally, I couldn't sleep for a couple of nights. I was around 12 years old. It was during the summer when school was off. My parents would work during the day, so it was just me and my sister home alone. One day we were in the basement watching a movie. I had to go to the bathroom. As I came out, I saw someone run into the storage room, which was between the stairs and the laundry room. I thought it was my sister hiding from me, so I started yelling her name as I approached the door. I looked in and I saw a white figure dash to the side from behind the furnace. I walked in and started yelling my sister's name again. I was just about to go look behind the furnace when my sister said, what, from right behind me. I asked her if she had just been in the storage room and she said no. I told my sister what happened and we were so scared we ran upstairs and spent the rest of the day hiding in our room until my parents came home. So first, a little context. My house was built in 1599 for a wealthy farming family. The house has had extensions from the Victorian era and most recently the 70s, but much of the original home remains. It was a couple of days ago, but I was in my living room, half watching the news and half on my phone. My dog, who is a very old and chilled back greyhound, suddenly jerks up from the sofa and looks directly to our window doors looking down at the garden. At the time, the curtains were closed, so I thought he maybe heard a fox or had been disturbed by a pesky fly or something. And because I know that dogs can sometimes sense ghosts, I joked, asking if Grandad had popped in to say hello. He was still staring, and then suddenly something tapped the back door quite loudly. Thinking it could be a fox after the chickens, I stood up and opened the curtains and looked out. Dark, but no fox. Then I heard it. It was almost like breathing. At first I thought it was the dog, but as I looked at him, he was facing the other way now. Yet still I heard breathing, quiet, but inside the room. I thought I had overreacted and it was my own breath, so I sat down. Yet it persisted and got slightly louder, and then I felt dizzy. It was like it was getting more intense, but not louder. And it felt like that dizziness you get if you stand up too fast after sitting for a while. But that made no sense as I had been on my feet and fine just moments ago. I don't know how to describe it, but it got worse and I could feel myself panicking despite my best efforts to stay calm which surprisingly to me did not work. And soon it was too much. I went out of the room and upstairs into my own room and I stayed there for the rest of the night. 
What made it even worse, though, was that while I sat there, trying to comprehend what had just happened, I heard footsteps right below me. I still can't explain it. About eight years ago, when I was 13, I was up until 3 a.m. playing Xbox online, as you do. I remember feeling a little peckish and I wanted some late night cereal. So I finished my game and went to go grab something to munch on. I turned on the hall lights and checked on my little brother, who was nine at the time, and my little sister, who was five. Being the oldest sibling, it was just something I would do. They were both fast asleep. As I got to the top of the staircase, I started to hear a little girl talking to herself. It completely creeped me out, but I thought maybe it was my sister sleep talking. But then it was even clearer, and I could really hear the sound of this girl's voice, and it was not my sister. I heard the voice coming from downstairs, and I got this horrible, sickening feeling inside my stomach. I got on my knees on the top of the staircase, and put my head down the stairs a little to hear the voice clearer. Then I figured that the voice was coming from the kitchen. Maybe she sensed I was there, because after that, when I tried to hear her even clearer, she laughed and I heard footsteps run off. I absolutely freaked out and ran into my mom and dad's room, telling them what had happened, but they both just told me to go back to bed. Needless to say, I did not get that bowl of cereal or sleep much that night. It was only a few weeks ago, now that I'm 21, that my mom has told me about the little girl who lives in our house. She says she feels her presence every now and then, mainly at the bottom of the stairs, which makes sense as our two dogs now and our old dog used to stare up the staircase at nothing and sometimes bark like crazy. To this day, when I watch TV, I sometimes feel her looking at me from the stairs, although I've never heard or experienced anything quite like I did when I was younger. I was driving home last night at about 1 a.m. It was already a full moon, so I was on high alert for any animals that might cross my path, as I drive through a very rural area that's mostly dense forest on either side of the road for miles to get back. Anyway, as I was turning a corner, a deer jumped out in front of me. I slammed on my brakes and honked the horn. The deer ran into the forest on the opposite side of the road, and I sped up, rounding the corner. That's when the freaky stuff started happening. A tall white figure was standing at the edge of the woods. I didn't get a good look at it because looking at it felt wrong. So I sped up, but it had a human shape other than being about nine feet tall. I couldn't make out a face, but it was glowing slightly. After that, I sped up, hoping to get home as fast as possible. And the whole way home after that incident, my car kept making weird noises, and my radio had way more static than usual. Does anyone know what this could have been? 